In this video will be going over section 3.4, which is on non-right triangles, uh, the law of sines and cosines. Right. Um, what we're going to be doing in this section is seeing how to use trig with triangles that appear in problems that aren't right triangles. And you might guess that most of the times when you have a some type of problem that involves a triangle, it might not be a right triangle very often. Um, and the two, tool, two tools we learn in this section are called the laws of sign, law of sines and cosines. Right. So what we're going to talk about, the first section, law of sines, look at the formula, how to know when we should use it. And there is kind of a little funny business with using the law of sines, which we'll see. Um, then we'll look at using the law of cosines, when to use it and how to solve with it. And then the last section, it's just really applying this stuff. You'll notice that most of the problems in this section are word problems or, you know, they are triangles, but it's described to you in a certain way. Um, so it really all feels like applications in that sense. But what we do in the last half of this section, the point of it is not really telling you which one we're going to be doing going into it. So we look for the correct things to know how to do it. So the law of signs, um, some of you, I, I tend to find even people that don't take trig somehow have seen law of signs quite often. Not really sure why, but the law of signs, we're going to start by drawing a generic right triangle, uh, not a right triangle, just a generic triangle. With I'm going to give the angles A, B, and C, and then its opposite sides, lowercase a, b, and c. So remember when we did right triangles, we had this sort of set up too, just the angle C and the side C were the hypotenuse and the right angle. But anytime we really deal with a triangle, we want to give things labels or at least think about giving things labels. And if we call the angles A, B, and C, we call it their opposite sides, the corresponding letter for simplicity. But the law of signs says the following. So if we do sine of the angle A, and then we divide it by its opposite side, then that equals sine of the angle B divided by its opposite side. Right. But there's nothing less special about C as far as its angle and side, so this also equals sine of C over its opposite side. Now, one thing, you know, the way we write C, lowercase and uppercase, they just look the same. So even though I won't really be able to, you know, write the difference very often, remember angles go inside trig functions. And then the side goes by itself. All right, but the setup, what you want to remember about the law of sines is each portion you do sine of the angle over its opposite side. Okay. Another thing I like to mention here because I don't think it's very often that you may have seen an equation with three equal signs. We don't use this all at once. It's just saying we can use any combination. If you need to solve for side A in a problem and you know stuff about angle A and C, the C stuff, then we would use sine of A over A equals sine of C over C. We wouldn't use the B part because we don't know it. Um, but the point is you can use any combination here. We just don't need to write out three different equations to represent that. Uh, one thing that's going to be kind of funny um, and I think I'm pretty sure I have it outlined below here, uh, but I just want to go ahead and mention it because it is so important, is when you use the law of sines to solve for an angle, it is possible that you can get two angles.
the main reason this is going to boil down to when we get to that problem is when you're solving sine of a equals a number for example sine is positive in quadrants one and two so you can have an angle in quadrant one and an angle in quadrant two the reason why that is something that's possible is because the angles in a triangle add up to 180 and those are exactly the angles of quadrants one and two so it's always possible to have an obtuse and acute angle for angle A. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to the problem. Uh, one nice thing is solving for a side length for in the law of sines is very, very, very easy. Uh, but the other thing I'd like to mention here before we start on the problems uh, about the law of sines, the main difference with the law of sines and law of cosines. If you look at, you know, just one pair of the formula, what we need is two angles and two sides in our formula. In all these problems, you're pretty much going to be given three things and you need to figure out a fourth thing. If those four things are two sides and two angles, you're going to use the law of sines most of the time. That's going to be different from the law of cosines when you see the formula. And I probably have that written in other places as well, but that's really the main way you figure out which one am I going to use. Yeah, I have that highlighted right here. All right, so we got one first one here, solving for a side length. And once again, it's really talking, you know, the point is recognizing which one you want to use. At this point, we've only talked about law of sine, so that's really all we can care about. But the reason we would want to use the law of sines to solve for x here is notice that we have two sides and their opposite angle. Which is exactly the setup for using law of sines. Now some people like to label everything like this is angle A and B and C and you can do that. But if you just remember the setup, the way law of sines works, you know, each part is a sine of an angle over its opposite side, it's probably less confusing than trying to write out your triangle with letters that aren't even included because you might accidentally make a mistake. So we got sine of an angle, let's start with 12 degrees, over its opposite side, which is x, equals sine of the other angle, 15 degrees, over its opposite side, which is 14. And we want to solve this for x, because right? that's what we're doing anyway. This is like making an equation when we use SOHCAHTOA, only now there's an extra part. But we solve for x. You can cross multiply here. So we got 14 times sine of 12 degrees equals x times sine of 15 degrees. One thing I would highly encourage you, like I did back when we do, dealt with Sokotoa and solving things, is getting the whatever you're solving for by itself and then typing in your calculator. So you don't have to worry about any rounding issues. We can finish solving for x by dividing by sine of 15 degrees. All right, so we do that. And we get x equals 14 sine of 12 degrees over sine of 15 degrees. And now type that in your calculator. Make sure you're in degree mode. So we go to mode. Oops, and I missed. Highlight degree. And now because I've already forgotten, we got 14 times sine of 12 degrees. divided by sine of 15 degrees and we get 11.246 doesn't say how far to round let's just pretend it's three spots 11.246 right but that's all we got to do for this one it just asks for x and we figured it out Now, one thing I would encourage you to do is just remind yourself why you're using the law of sines. 
We mentioned it at the beginning why we would choose it over the eventual law of cosines, but also this isn't a right triangle, so you have to use law of sines or cosines. You have nothing else to use. Okay. The next one, number two here, says solve the triangle ABC. I'll explain what that means in a second. If angle A is 44 degrees, side A is 14 degrees, side B is 18 degrees. So we're given three things, like we said we would be at the beginning. We want to assume angle A is opposite of side B, angle B is opposite of side B, and angle C is opposite of side C. And if you like to, which I do recommend, just draw your triangle. Uh, labeling it, since you're given labels, is probably a good thing for this one. So angle A is 44 degrees. We're not told what angle B is. I'm just going to leave that as B. And we're not told what angle C is. We'll leave that as C. We are told two of the sides. We are told side A is 14. Side B is 18. And we are not told what side C is. Right. But what it means by solve the triangle is figure out everything else that's missing. So we want to figure out angle B and C and side C. And it says that specifically on the homework. But what this means is, is figure out the other three things that are missing. All right, so the thing you want to look at is, what do we know? What can we figure out right away? The biggest thing you do not want to do is think you can solve for C right away, at least using the law of science. The reason you can't solve for C right away is because, you know, we don't have, we would have three sides and one angle, which is not the setup for law of science. But also, we cannot use the Pythagorean theorem because this is not a right triangle. At least we don't know it is. So when it's not a right triangle, you can't use Sokotoa. You cannot use Pythagorean's theorem. You cannot use either one of those. That's a funny looking H. So cat. Right, so we really only have the law of sines, but we can use it to solve for angle B because angle B, we have the opposite side B, and we can use the law of sines with angle A and opposite of side A. All right, so we've got sine of the angle A, 44 degrees divided by side A, which is 14, equals sine of the angle B, which is what we're trying to solve for, over side B, which is 18. All right now we are solving for angle B. You don't want to cross multiply here completely because you don't want to bring the 14 over there. You're just going to bring it back to the other side. But we can multiply the 18 on the other side and we get 18 times sine of 44 degrees over 14 equals sine of B. Now let's go ahead and since we're going to try to solve for B, let's type this in our calculator and see what it comes out to be. 18 sine of 44 divided by 14 gives us 0.89313. And then to solve for B, we know what to do here. Even though it kind of might feel like a different section, you still have the same tools in your background. We do the sine inverse of each side. So we got B equals sine inverse of 0 0.89313. Let's 
go ahead and type that in our calculator. We are in degree mode, so we're going to stay in degree mode because we're dealing with degrees here. Oops. And we get 63.2692. I feel like I'm going dyslexic right now. I keep writing numbers backwards. 63.2692. Degrees. Right. But one thing that is not actually okay is thinking this is the only answer for B. It certainly seems like there should only be one angle, but we only drew a picture just for a visualization. If you solve this, right, either at this point or this point, you're trying to solve where sine is positive, sine is positive, and quadrants. 1 and 2. We're in degree mode here. So we've got 0 degrees and 360 degrees. So just to give an understanding of why we can have another answer, we figured out the angle in quadrant 1 is 63.2692. degrees. But we also have a possible angle in quadrant 2. And that would be 180 minus the 63, because our reference angle is that exactly that 63.2692 degrees. And so what is 180 minus 63.2692? Let's figure that out. We got 180 minus 63.2692. We got 116.731 degrees. All right now, what we just figured out, we're not saying that there are two triangles. What we're saying is if this was some type of word problem, there would be both of these possibilities for B, and we have to solve the rest using the possibility for both. So we want to solve each meaning. We figured out angle B can be one of these two things. We're going to plug in one of them solve for the C information, then plug in the other one and solve the C information. So we have two possible triangles. Now when you look at the homework problems, um, some of a lot of them that have the two possible triangles really guide you. It'll tell you, okay, we've got two possible triangles. What's the smaller angle? What's the larger angle? Okay, and using that from there, what do you get for side C? What do you get for angle C? All right, but we'll go ahead and work out the two possibilities. We'll do um, angle B as 63.2692 degrees first, and angle B as 116.731 degrees second. All right, once again, I know this is not necessarily an obvious thing, but when you get to word problems, if you ever solve for an angle in a word problem using the law of signs, you would know visually if your triangle was acute or obtuse, and you would pick the appropriate one. All we're doing in this problem is saying, we're, we know that both are possible, let's just solve both. All right, but I wanna go ahead and just draw a picture for each below and then figure out the information. All right, so we had in our original triangle, we had 44 degrees for A. B, we just are going to use for this one, 63.2692 degrees. Angle C, we weren't told. 
side A we know is 14, side B we know is 18, and side C is something we have to figure out. Uh, but once again, we, have, we want to figure out what is angle C and what is side C. Now angle C is not really terrible to figure out at all. Once you have the other two angles, the third one has to be what we get, what we need to get to make these add to 180. So angle C is 180 minus 44 minus 63.2692. Let's just figure that out. 180 minus 44 minus 63.2692. So we get 72.731 for angle C. Wait, was it 70? 2.731. Make myself a little more room here. It's not so jumbled up. 72.731 degrees. And now we want to also get side C. To get side C, we want to use the law of sines, right? Because we know everything. We know all other five pieces of information. And in number one, we showed how pretty much easy it is to solve for a side using the law of sines. So, you know, in general, if you're solving for a side and you have the choice between the law of cosines or the law of sines, Law of cosine or law of sines is quicker. If you want to figure out an angle, what we'll see from next section, law of cosines is better. But you're not always able to do both the ideal way. All right, so we use our law of sines. We got sine of C, 72.3731 degrees over side C equals. Now you have everything else here, but I would recommend using sine of A over A because that stuff's not rounded and it's just easier to type with whole numbers. So we got sine of 44 degrees over 14. Then we cross multiply and just solve that out for C. We got 14 times sine of 72.731 degrees equals C times sine of 44 degrees. And then we divide each side by sine of 44 degrees and type that in our calculator to get C. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. C, we've got 14 sine of 72.731 divided by sine of 44 and we get C is 19.245 in this triangle Now, once again, this is one of the two possible triangles. This is the one where angle B is the 63.2692 degrees. Now we've got to do the same thing, solve for angle C and side C, when angle B is 116 degrees. So I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to try to draw angle B much more up too, so it does look like it's supposed to. 116, you know, that angle. And then angle C is what we got to figure out. As side A, we were told is 14. Side B, we were told is 18. And we need to figure out side C. One thing to keep in mind is the answers we got for C over here have nothing to do with what they'll be over here. There's not going to be a pattern for them. But we want to solve for them the same exact way. 
So if we get angle C, we just do what we did before. We get 180 minus our two angles, 44, and this time 116.731. And we get 19.269 degrees. And then to get side C, we are going to do what we did last time, pretty much exactly the same, use the law of sines. We don't have a right triangle, so we only have the law of sines or cosines. We haven't talked about the law of cosines anyway, but it'll work out the same way over here, just that our angle C is different. So we got sine of angle C, which is 19.269 degrees over side C, equals sine of angle A, 44 degrees over 14. Yep. Take the couple steps to solve it out, see what C equals, and then type it in our calculator. So cross multiply, we got 14 times sine of 19.269 degrees equals C times sine of 44 degrees and then divide each side by the sine of 44 degrees. And we have C equals 14 times sine of 19.269 degrees divided by sine of 44 degrees. And we get 6.651. Okay, so as you can see, the sides for C are very different. The angles for C are very different. Um, you know, if you do have the question of how do I know when I only have one or two triangles, you know, if you didn't, weren't guided in the homework, well, the reason you would know is if you tried to solve for angle C here in the bigger one, if you get a negative angle, then it's not possible. All right, it's only, it's not even guaranteed to be possible over here, but it works for both in this case. But if you have an acute angle, you might also have an obtuse angle when you use the law of sines. But if you end up with a negative angle when you solve for the last one, then it's not possible to have that angle. So the next little bit we're going to go over is the law of cosines, when to use it, how to solve triangles using the law of cosines. Now the reason we have a law of cosines is because sometimes you'll be given information about a triangle in which the law of sines doesn't work. You won't have three of the four things needed to solve an equation. So the law of cosines, you know, we really start by the same kind of triangle. We just have any old triangle, angle A, B, and C, not a right triangle, and their opposite sides, A, B, and C. The law of cosines looks a lot like the Pythagorean theorem with an extra part. A lot of people write three formulas for this. You really only need one. I'm going to write all three and then explain why you only need one. Uh, but the law of sines says something like this. a squared equals b squared plus c squared. Once again, the c is the side length. The angle wouldn't be by itself. Minus 2 times b times c times cosine of the angle a. And if it helps, put a little multiplication sign in there. But it's 2 times b times c times cosine of a. Um, nothing is special about the angle A and side A being by itself. Uh, there is an, a, 
many equivalent ways to write this. You could have b squared equals a squared plus c squared minus 2 times a times c times cosine of the angle b. And then the other way is the one with you have c squared by itself. So that is the law of cosines. All of these are the same. The one thing I want to point out right away, the reason why I really only use what it says, you know, I don't use the formulas exactly, although certainly memorizing one of them is good. What you want to remember here is that notice the side that's squared by itself over here is corresponding to the angle on the other side. So in the last one, c squared is over here, and the angle c is right there. What is in between is the other two sides. So what you want to remember about the law of cosines is it looks a lot like the Pythagorean theorem. If you just look at the first part, c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So we've got this extra thing. But what you really, really want to remember about it is that the side by itself uses the angle opposite of it. Right, meaning we have b squared over here, the angle inside is b. a squared over here, the angle is a. Same thing with c. Right, so that's something that's important to remember. You really don't need to memorize all three. There's just no use for it. Another thing to mention about this is what you need to solve. Each one of these, since they're all the same, I'll just look at this bottom here. You need all three sides, A, B, and C, and you need one angle. So to use the law of, sine, law of cosines, the things you're thinking about are having three sides and one angle. So law of cosines, three sides and one angle. Law of sines, two sides and two angles. That's a really, really useful way to know which one you're going to use if you're looking at a triangle. Right, which is exactly what I've written here. What we are going to see with the couple problems I have in this section is the law of cosines isn't nearly as complicated as the law of sines because when you solve for an angle or solve for a side, it's just pretty straightforward. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see in the application section how a certain pitcher might be able to throw you off as far as what to do. Right, but these are going to be pretty direct. Uh, this first one says, to find the distance across a lake, a surveyor has taken measurements shown so this angle has 29.6 degrees. This side length of our triangle is 3.91. This one's 2.41. Use this picture to find the width of the lake. All right, so it's asking us to find this dash side, which I'm going to go ahead and label as x. And immediately what you want to notice is that what we're interested in is three sides and an angle. And even better, is that the side we want is opposite the angle. So we got three sides and an angle. And the side we want is opposite of the angle. All right, as we'll see in the application section, we'll have a problem like this, but we'll know a different angle and it does make it more challenging. But this is the ideal setup. If you're going to solve for a side using the law of cosines, you need this stuff, three sides and an angle. And the side you want being opposite of an angle is great. So we want to use the law of cosines because of this. Now, if you remember the setup of the formula, the side that is unknown squared goes by itself. The other two sides are squared and added together. So we got equals 2.41 squared plus 3.91 squared minus 2 times the other two sides, 2.41 times 3.91 times 
times cosine of the angle that is opposite of the side x, which is the 29.6 degrees. Now, the great thing about this formula, and especially the way it's set up, is this is very messy over here. But you can type this entire thing in your calculator if you want, and it's telling you what x squared is. Now, if you're not comfortable doing the whole thing in your calculator once, which is fine, just do each part. Uh, but let me go ahead and do it. So we got 2.41 squared plus 3.91 squared minus 2 times 2. 0.41 times 3.91 times cosine of the angle, which was 29.6 degrees. And I'm pretty sure we're in degree mode. Yes. You know, it's so long it goes off the screen, but you hit enter and it gives you what x squared is. So x squared is 4.7095 about. And then we just finish by getting x. And the one thing you want to think about here, we don't have to do the plus or minus because the width is going to be positive. But we're not going to say the lake is negative miles. So when we do the square root, it's just the square root. We don't have to worry about a negative number. So we'll take a square root of our answer. If you want, you can hit second answer and it'll just to the whole thing for you. We got 2.170, rounded to three spots. And our units are miles if you are asked. So the width of this triangle is about 2.170 miles. All right now, the next one we have here is pretty much the same exact problem, except it's not a picture of a lake, it's just a picture of a triangle. So you would you would do this one exactly the same way. I'm gonna just go through and do it anyway, but if you can draw the parallels for what we're doing here, from number one to number two, you can see the setup's exactly the same. All right, we wanna use the law of cosines because we are talking about three sides and an angle. And once again, we are lucky enough that the side we want is opposite of the angle we have. Okay, so we've got x squared equals 21 squared plus 13 squared, the two other sides squared, minus two times the two other sides, times cosine of the angle. Right, and once again, you can just type this whole thing in your calculator, do the square root, and that is it. All right, so we've got 21 squared plus 13 squared minus two times 21 times 13 times cosine of the angle, which I believe was 13 degrees. Yes. So once again, this is x squared though. We've got x squared equals 77.9939. We wanna finish getting for x, just do the square root here. We get x equals whatever the square root of that is. Let's see. And you can do the answer thing again. x equals 8.83. Doesn't say how far to round. Let's just go two spots this time. All right, but once again, really the same problem. I just wanted to reiterate the same exact point that I mentioned the first time. We have three sides and one angle, which is why we use the law of cosines but it's really, really, really easy, you know, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I, this might very well be one of the easiest things we do in the entire course. 
because you just plug in everything into your formula, put it, the whole thing in your calculator, and that is it. All right, so the last one we have for the law of cosine section says find the angle C if a, side A is 2.85, side B is 3.86, side C is 4.34, they're in miles. Enter your answer in degrees rounded to one decimal spot. Assume that angle A is opposite of side A, angle B opposite of side B, and so on. All right, so like with the other section, if you're described a triangle, it's good to draw it out and label everything like it tells you. So you got angle A, angle B, angle C, and then side A, side B, and side C are the opposites. We're told all the sides, A is 2.85, B is 3.86, C is 4.34, and we want to find angle C. Right? We don't even care about angles A and B, we just want angle C. Once again, you want to ask yourself, because you won't be told, you won't be working on a, a particular problem in the section, which one do we want to use, law of sines or cosines? Well, three sides and an angle, we want to use the law of cosines. Three sides and an angle, I wrote that backwards. Three sides and one angle. Uh, but the one we want to make sure we set up, because we're solving for angle C, this is the side that's going to go by itself the, in our equation because it's opposite of the angle we want. All right, so remember the setup for law of cosines. You have the side that's opposite the angle you're going to use by itself. And I got too used to writing x from the last two problems. Um, 4.34 squared equals. Then we have the other two sides squared and added together. 2.85 squared plus 3.86 squared minus 2 times the other two sides again times cosine of the angle. And that's what we're solving for this time so that's exactly what it looks like now this is solving an equation for an angle we know what we've got to do we got to get this by itself it really isn't terrible you just want to make sure you simplify in the correct way All right, if you want square out each part and combine like terms add the numbers together so let's see what is 4.34 squared We got 18.8356. Now these two, since we're squaring them and adding them together without any variables or anything, I'm just gonna do that. So we got 2.85 squared plus 3.86 squared. And we get 23.0221. Minus, the reason why we can't include that over here is because it's multiplying cosine of C. So multiply these three numbers together. 2 times 2.85 times 3.86, we get 22.002. Cosine of the angle C. So we made it look a lot nicer. We're trying to get this by itself. Continue, we would subtract the 23.00 or 0221 from each side. So 18.8356. 
minus 20.3.0221, we get negative 4.1865. Right, it doesn't matter that it's negative, don't worry about that. Equals negative 22.002 cosine of C. Divide each side by the negative 22.002. Get the C part, cosine of C part by itself, finally. And we get 0 0.91028. I think I said that backwards, 0 0.19028. Yeah, 0 0.19028. That equals cosine of C. And you know how to solve this because... We've done this quite a bit. We do the cosine inverse of each side. And we get cosine inverse 0 0.19028 equals angle C. Since we're talking about degrees, enter your answer in degrees, round it to one decimal spot. Make sure you're in degree mode. So we got cosine inverse of that number. We get 79.03, or just 79.0 degrees. All right, now to address the question, why do we only have one answer here? Why do we not have two possible answers? All right, well, the two quadrants cosine is positive in is quadrants one and four. And the problem with having an angle in quadrant four is that it's gonna be bigger than 180. In fact, that's the true, true for quadrant three as well. Angles in quadrant three and four are bigger than 180. Since all the angles in a triangle can only add up to 180, that means it's not possible to have an answer in there. So we cannot have an angle and a triangle be in quadrants three or four. Right, so whenever you use the law of cosines, the nice thing is when you do the cosine inverse part, your angle's always in quadrant one or two, and that's your only answer, whatever you get from the calculator. That's why we have a huge benefit from using the law of cosines instead of the law of sines for solving for an angle. All right, we'll now move on to the last topic. It's nothing new, it's just a couple problems where it might not be obvious how you're gonna solve them, how we're gonna use the law of sines or cosines in them. Uh, and this first one looks very, very similar the one we just did in the law of cosines. We have a lake here, and we want to figure out the width of the lake, or the distance of the lake. Same thing as the one above with the law of cosines. And the thing about this one is, if you write out what we have and what we know, we have three sides and one angle again. And certainly that indicates we should use the law of cosines. Now there's absolutely nothing wrong with losing, using the law of cosines here. You just have to be careful setting it up because the angle we have is over here, the 51.2 degrees. So what's gonna go by itself is the side opposite. When we set up the law of cosines. We cannot just put x squared by itself because we want it to be easy to solve. It's not gonna be correct. We only use x squared by itself if we know this angle down here. Right. So we can still set it up exactly the same. What's gonna happen 
when we actually solve it is it's going to just be a little more complicated, a little more annoying for lack of a better term, but we can still solve it. So we got 512 squared by itself. I guess I didn't even actually write, so I should write it. We have three sides and one angle. We want to use the law of cosines. And we got our opposite side of the angle squared equals the other two sides squared and added together. So x squared plus 295 squared minus 2 times the other two sides so times x times 295 times cosine of our angle, which is 51.2 degrees. Right. Now, just simplify this like last time. Don't try to do too much at once. So we can multiply the 51, 512 squared together, 295 squared, and then all this is multiplied here times x. So let's just multiply those things together. All right, what is 512 squared? Now I know the number is going to be very big, but this is just the homework question, and I wanted to make sure the numbers are accurate. We got 262,144. equals x squared is just that. We don't know what x is. It's just x squared. Then plus 295 squared. We get 87,025. Minus, and then if we multiply all this stuff together and throw our x on at the end, we've got 2 times 295 times cosine of 51.2 degrees. All right, so double check that. 2 times 295 times cosine of 51.2 degrees, and we get 369.696. But don't forget about the x. Now what you want to notice about this equation here is that we've got x squared and x in it. That means with uh, different powers of x, we're going to either factor it. You could probably guess with the numbers that we're presented with, we are going to use the quadratic formula to solve. But we know in order to use the quadratic formula, you need to make it equal to 0. All right, so we subtracted 262,144 from each side. All right, when we do that, we've got 0 equals x squared minus, I'm going to write it in descending powers of x, 369.696x. And then what is 87,025 minus 262,144? We get negative 175,119. And let's just double check our number there, 175119. All right, so that's what we've got. Now use the quadratic formula to solve from here. We got x equals negative b. b is this number, so we got 369,000. Point six nine six plus or minus the square root. Yes, I know the number is going to be very messy because of how big they were, but that's just the way it is. B squared, negative 369.696 squared minus 4 times A, which is 1, times C, which is negative 175,119, all over 2 times A, but A is 1. All right, now what I would do, I wouldn't try to go too slowly here because it would be easy to make a mistake, but I would start by figuring out the number inside the square root. All right, so we've got the number inside the square root is negative 369.696 squared. We got a double minus in here, which makes a plus. And then we got four times the 175,119. 
and the inside of our square root we get 837,151 Remember that's inside the square root, 837,000, 151.134. I think it's 1324. I just messed up saying that. Yeah, 1324. Divide all divided by 2. All right, and we'll just keep solving this. Uh, take the square root. What is the square root of that number? Nine hundred fourteen point nine five nine six. Over two. Now we've got it as simplified as we can without breaking it apart with our plus minus. So break it apart, see what the two numbers we get are. and see what the two numbers we get for x are. Okay, so we get 369,000, wait, not, not 1,000, 369.696 plus 914.9596, or the previous thing we got, and then divide that by two. We get 642. Point Three, three. I don't remember how far around, but if we have to round to two decimal spots, we get that. So that's one possible answer. The other possible answer we get is 369.696 minus 914.9596. And then divide that by two. We get negative 272. Point six three one eight. All right now we got two numbers for x, but you want to think about which one of these makes sense. And we're talking about a length on a triangle. We're talking about the width of a lake. So even though we got two answers, one doesn't make any sense because length cannot be negative. That means our Answer is the 642.33. Now, one thing I'll say, if you're worried about what if I get two positive answers, you won't. You won't get two positive answers here because it is an actual fixed triangle. It's not like the one we did with the law of sines way earlier where we had two possibilities. Right. So it's pretty standard whenever you use the law of cosines that you're going to get just one answer. It could be possible if you don't have a set triangle and you're just describe some points that you could get to, but they would both have to be positive numbers here. Right. But as you can see, just changing the angle that we know from here to here makes it much longer. Uh, you can also do this one using the law of sines. You can use the law of sines to figure out this angle. But what you'd have to be careful on when, when we saw earlier using the law of science to solve for an angle is you have to be careful that you only have the one possible angle. So that's something that can be a little concerning is if you solve for this angle, are you going to get just that one answer or might you get two? Because if you get two, then you got to go through both and see which X value is going to work. All right, well, we've got two more word problems here. Now, this, these are true word problems in the sense that you, you know, you'll see a, you might see a picture, but you got to be careful about how you're setting up and solving everything, labeling what you need to label correctly. All right, so this one says a steep mountain is inclined at 74 degrees to the horizontal and rises to a height of 3,400 feet above the surrounding plain. So what I'm going to do. Just like we did back in the 1.4 section, 
pretty much any time we've done a tr word problem is I want to draw a picture representing this situation. All right, so I've got our plane, our ground, and we have a mountain. Let's pretend our mountain's brown, and it's inclined at an angle of 74 degrees to the horizontal. That's what that means. It's inclined. If we, our mountain's connecting to the horizontal at 74 degrees, and it rises to a height of 3,400 feet above the plane. So if I draw this straight down, this is 3,400. Right. So all in this sentence, it's telling me this. All right. The next step says a cable car is to be installed running to the top of the mountain from a point 850 feet out in the plane from the base of the mountain. Right, so we're gonna have a cable car that's attached to the top and then it's attached out in the plane on the ground. We got a cable here. Should probably label the blue part's cable, the brown part was the mountain, the side of the mountain. MT for short. And what we're told about this cable is that it's 850 feet away from the base of the mountain, which is right here. Right, so it's not 850 feet away from the middle, it's 850 feet out from the base of the mountain, where the mountain ends. And what it's asking for here, find the shortest length of the cable needed, round your answer to the nearest foot. Right, one thing I'll go ahead and say is that this shortest length needed, all it's saying is find the cable length, which we'll call x, because you could have it be loose or taut, but you want that cable to be tight, a tight straight line, and that's all it's asking for. What is X in this picture? Now, once you've gone through the trouble of setting up your picture to seeing what does this look like, you don't want to be completely in the mindset of only the law of sines and cosines, but you also want to think about how am I going to figure out X? You might use Sokotoa. You'll notice that there is a right triangle in here because this is a right angle. You just want to go through the steps in your head. What am I going to use here? Well, there's a lot of options for this one. I'm just going to show you one way. Uh, but no matter what you do, you're going to have to figure out something before you figure out X. You can figure out this side length here from this picture. If you figure out this side length, then, well, what you know is you know how long this side is, you know how long this side is, and you could actually just use the Pythagorean theorem. I wanna do it on purpose using the law of sines or cosines, which means I actually want to figure out the length of the mountain side. Now the reason why that will allow us to solve for x if I figure out y here is this angle here has to be 180 minus this angle because they intersect on a line. So this has to be 106 degrees. And if you look at just the right half of the triangle here, if we figure out y, we know one of the side lengths, we'd be finding the other. So we'd have three sides and one angle. So the steps here are to figure out why, then use that to solve x. All right, so what you want to do to figure out why, I'm going to draw just the interior right triangle here. Get y. We have 3400 as the vertical side. Y is the hypotenuse, and the angle here is 74 degrees. All right, this is a right triangle, and I think it's always good to remember that when you have a right triangle, you have a lot of stuff. You could also use the law of sines here, because this is opposite the right angle. Um, but I'm just going to use Sokotoa, because it is a right triangle. We have an angle, we have its opposite and a hypotenuse of interest. So we got sine of our angle 74 degrees equals opposite 3400 over 
hypotenuse, which is y. Now we solved this something like this quite a bit, but it's been a while. You know what to do though. You multiply each side by y, get get y out of the denominator. So we get y times sine of 74 degrees equals 3400. And then we divide each side by sine of 74 degrees. And we're going to have y. So we got y equals 3400 over sine of 74 degrees. Just double checking I'm in degree mode. Yeah, I am. So we got 3400 divided by sine of, I already forgot, was it 74? Yeah, 74 degrees. 3,537. Oops, don't want that stray mark causing confusion. And then since we want to round our final answer, and this isn't actually our final answer, I'm going to go to two spots for now, zero, two. But as we outlined here, if I solve for y, then I'll be able to solve for x. To see how to actually solve for x separated, I'm going to draw that right half of the triangle we have, this part right here. So this bottom side is 850. This y side right now, this is y, which is the 3537.02. This is x, which is what we ultimately want to solve for, and this is 106 degrees. But now we set up our equation like we talked about. We use the law of cosines to solve for this, for x. And the angle we know is opposite the side we want, which is perfect. We got x squared equals the other two sides squared minus 2 times the other two sides squared times cosine of our angle. 106 degrees. This is like the first two that we solved with the law of cosines. You can pretty much type the entire thing in your calculator and then do the square root. So we got 537.02 squared plus 850 squared minus 2 times 3537.02 times 850 times cosine of 106 degrees. I'm just double checking I typed that in all right. It is a lot at once, so if you don't want to type it in all at once, I understand. And I got everything right here, so I'm going to hit enter. It's going to be a very big number. should be alarming to you that that will remind you to do the square root because that's a very big answer. If we do the square root of our answer, we get 3858.8 or 3859 rounded to the nearest whole number. And it is feet. So we're talking about feet here. The, the numbers here in the original problem were in feet. All right, but that is the really common way to do a lot of word problems involving the law of sines or cosines is it's not really going to be direct. You're probably going to use a right triangle to figure out a side at some point. And then after you figure out that side, then use the law of sines or cosines. Right. Now the last one we have here is pretty similar in nature of how we're going to do it, but it looks a lot different. Right, so the last one here, it says, a pilot is flying over a straight highway. He determines the angles of depression to two mileposts, 5.6 kilometers apart, to be 28 and 47 degrees, as shown in the figure. I forgot to include the question when I typed it up, so I'm going to write it now. The question is, what is the elevation of the plane? in meters. 
Right, they're giving us kilometers, we want it in meters. All right, so our pitcher actually diagrams the pitcher for us. You have your plane here, the angles of depression, 28 and 47 degrees down to these two mile posts, which are 5.6 kilometers apart. And what we're asked for is how high is the plane off the ground, which if I kind of draw a dashed line, is it's asking for H right here. So I'm just going to make a comment here. What we want is to figure out H. We want to figure out H. Now, one thing you want to notice is H is a part of an interior triangle. You know, it's a part of a right triangle, either the left or right side. They're both right triangles. It's not a part of the big triangle. If we want to figure out H, what we have to do is figure out one of these sides. Right? Knowing that this is 5.6 on the bottom isn't that helpful to figure out H because we don't know how long each portion is. All right, so in order to figure out H, just to outline, I'm only picking this length, but you can figure out this length as well. If we figure out X here in this picture on the right half of the triangle, we have H and X. The reason why we'll be able to figure this out is we actually know the angles inside here. You can get all the angles. Since this cuts it directly in half, this these two angles here are going to add up to 90 degrees, the 47 and this. So this is going to be 90 minus 47, which is 43 degrees. So that's the top side here, 43 degrees. Now, I don't really need to point out the other side necessarily, but we might as well. So if we do need it, we have it. These two also add up to 90 degrees because it's a right angle formed right here. So this one is 90 minus 28, which is 62. All right, now it's not on this triangle that I'm interested in, so I don't have to worry about it. Labeling it over there. Um, if you want, you'll see that we won't really need it, um, but if you want, you can figure out this angle as well down here. This is going to be 47 degrees because these add up to 90. It's also the same as the angle up here because when a, two parallel lines are cut by a line, the opposite angles are the same. I'm not sure how familiar you may be with that, but we also know it that way. Same idea for this one. This is going to be 28 degrees because the two insides are going to add up to 62. Okay. All right, so we've identified really what we need to do. If we can figure out x, then we can use like sine or cosine here to get h. So the question is how do we get x? Well, what I'm going to do is just draw the big triangle and label these, so these sides and angles that we know. So the bottom side is 5.6. This side is 28 degrees. This is x, which is what we're looking for. This is 47 degrees. And if you look at what the top angle should be, you can get it a lot of different ways. But since we've got this is 63 and 43, it's just those added together, which is 105 degrees. All right, but there's multiple ways to figure this one out. You can also do 180 minus these two. Whichever way you figure out. There's a lot of ways to figure out all the angles in this picture. You just really got to know where to start. Right, but if you look at our picture here, how to figure out x, what you want to realize is that we have we have three angles and two sides. That would encompass using the law of cos law of sines, but not the law of cosines. The law of cosines requires all three sides, which we do not have. So we're going to use the law of sines here.
but that also becomes evident based on what we need and what we know. We know 105 degrees and its opposite side. We know 28 degrees and need its opposite side. So we're going to use the law of sines with these two pairs. We got sine of 28 degrees over its opposite side equals sine of 105 degrees over its opposite side. Now go through and solve this for x, just like we did in the first half of this uh, section, this video. Cross multiply, we get 5.6 times sine of 28 degrees equals x times sine of 105 degrees. And then we divide each side by sine of 105 degrees to get x by itself. Finish it up over here. X equals 5.6 times sine of 28 divided by sine of 105 degrees. We are in degree mode. 5.6 sine of 28 divided by sine of 105. We get 2.722. Let's just go a little further than that. 2.7218. If you're worried about the rounding at the end because we're given kilometers and we are going to want meters, then you can just use the entire number when you type in the next part. Anytime you change units, there can be a little iffiness as to rounding far enough. All right, but now if you look at our right triangle here, once we have figured out x, which we did, then we can just use SOHCAHTOA, which in this problem is necessary in the last problem we may have been able to get around it but this one we have to um, but if you use want to use the 43 degree angle then adjacent over hypotenuse we'd use cosine if you want to use 47 with sine opposite over hypotenuse go for it so we get cosine of 43 degrees equals h over x 2.7218 then we multiply each side by the 2.7218. We get h equals 2.7218 times cosine of 43 degrees. And once again, if you're worried about rounding, just hit your answer. It'll type in that number for you times cosine of 43 degrees. And we got 1.9905 for h. And this is meter, this is kilometers. Now, if you want to go from kilometers to meters, if you're not very familiar with the metric system, you multiply by a thousand. Or you move the decimal place to the right three spots. Right, but if you move the decimal place over three spots, we get 1990.5. And if you want to round to the nearest whole number, 1991 meters. Okay. But those are two ways to use the law of sines and cosines in conjunction with SOHCAHTOA, which is a very common application and word problems right. but I always find this problem very interesting it's kind of impressive to me you can figure out the elevation of a plane knowing almost so little you know how far two things are apart and their angles but you don't know anything else necessarily right away and you can still figure out your height um, but anyway that is this section on the law of sines and cosines